Deep in the heart of Reston, Virginia, lies one of the most powerful, influential, yet secretive family dynasties in America. This family dynasty is behind the construction of mega projects like the Hoover Dam, the underwater channel tunnel between England and France, they helped the US military build and maintain their nuclear ICBM bases, they managed the infamous Los Alamos laboratory where the nuclear bomb was created, while simultaneously building oil infrastructure for some of the world's most notorious governments like Saddam Hussein's Iraq, Gaddafi's Libya, and of course the Saudi royal family. They even profited off of Hurricane Katrina. And this family has been deeply embedded with the CIA, Department of Defense, and the Department of Energy since the beginning, with some of their board members filling some of the highest positions in government, from the Secretary of Defense to the Secretary of State to the Secretary of Energy, which is a nice sounding title for the person at the helm of America's nuclear power and nuclear weapons. The New York Times is quoted saying no other private corporation in modern history has had closer ties to the federal government than this one. Which means, this corporation has profited off of practically every major geopolitical event over the last 100 plus years. In fact, it's safe to say that this corporation single-handedly built the modern world as we know it. They've become the biggest construction company in the world. And yet, you have never heard of their name. Out of all the secretive family dynasties we've covered on this channel, this one is by far one of the most secretive. Nowhere else have we seen a family so influential, so all-encompassing, and yet so elusive at the same time, with the internet being almost completely scrubbed of their name. Why? Because no other corporation has profited off of war, third world countries, and natural disasters quite as much as this one. Stay dangerous and say hello to Bechtel, the secretive family that engineered the world. One thing the wealthy elite like Bechtel invests in are financial advisors. And you may be thinking, but Jake, why would you want a financial advisor? Well, for me, once I started making a little bit more money, I quickly realized that making money is one thing, but knowing how to preserve and grow money is a whole different ballgame. I never learned whether I should have a Roth IRA or a 401k, or how much I should contribute to those, or what kind of insurance I should get. That's when I realized that I needed someone to advise me on the stuff, who ideally has a legal responsibility to act in my best interests, a financial advisor. But financial advisors typically cost thousands of dollars a year. That is where domain money comes in. Domain money gives you your own certified financial advisor who can help you with your investing, savings, insurance, taxes, family planning, all for just $79 a month with no hidden fees or investment minimums. Basically, domain advisors can help you avoid stress so you can focus on just the things that matter. They don't use jargon and they give you the best possible advice for a fraction of the cost. Also, domain has a 5% APY savings account and it will prepare and file your taxes. Pretty cool. If you want to see if domain money is right for you, click the link below and book your free 30-minute session with a domain advisor today. Click the link below to book a call now. Thanks to Domain Money for being the paid sponsor of this video. Born into a lower-class farming family in Illinois in 1872, there was nothing Warren Bechtel wanted more than to escape his life of backbreaking work and poverty. And he finally got that chance when he married Clara, the daughter of a wealthy family in Indiana. With help from his new father-in-law, Warren went into the cattle business where he thought he could make a fortune, but he thought wrong. By the end of the 19th century, both of America's cattle and corn markets had bottomed out, and both he and Clara went bankrupt. Desperate to dig himself out of the hole he was in, Warren began transporting material for railway companies that were expanding through the West. With his own team of mules, he began making up to $2.75 a day, or around $90 a day in today's money. And his time on the railways taught him more than any engineering degree could. Noticing his hard work and skill in handling construction equipment, Warren was offered a job working on the very same railways he was moving material for, and it didn't take him long to stand out. Every cent he made working his new job, he put it into buying and renting his own construction equipment. And by 1906, thanks to a loan from his father-in-law, he was ready to start working for himself. Slowly, Warren's company known simply as Bechtel grew in size and reputation. By the time the Ford Motor Company began mass-producing their iconic Model T cars, Warren Bechtel's company was one of the few companies capable of building all the new roads that those cars would need to drive on. And from there, it was nowhere but up for Bechtel. By 1936, Bechtel built the Hoover Dam. By World War II, Bechtel was building ships for the US government. And by the end of the war, Bechtel developed his love for all things nuclear, winning two contracts to build two nuclear power plants in two years. Bechtel had pioneered a whole new business model for construction companies called turnkey contracts, where Bechtel would handle everything from the design and planning to the construction and delivery of projects for a fixed fee. By the middle of the 20th century, Bechtel was already one of the biggest family-run construction companies in America. But Bechtel was hungry for more. It didn't want to just conquer America, it wanted to go global. 
and to do that, it would have to join the big leagues. And since only the most ruthless and ambitious companies reached the top, that's what Bechtel had to become. In 1947, President Harry Truman created a brand new intelligence apparatus designed to push America's interests around the world, the CIA. And right from the start, Bechtel saw the CIA as an opportunity to blur the line between what was best for the country and what was best for the company. In 1951, Steve Bechtel was a founding member of the National Committee for a Free Asia, an organization created to counteract communism overseas. And what was a construction mogul doing on a committee to fight communism in Asia? A continent that happened to need a lot of construction? Who knows? But what we do know is that this organization would be later exposed as a CIA front. In return for his great work, Steve was appointed as the CIA's liaison with the Business Council. And that's when the interests of the CIA and Bechtel started looking a lot more similar. By 1953, Steve Bechtel had become close friends with the infamous CIA director Alan Dulles. But by 1961, Alan Dulles was out. And who replaced him as the director of the CIA? Why none other than John McCone, an ex-Bechtel engineer and one of Steve Bechtel's closest friends. This was at the height of the Cold War, when the CIA was overthrowing governments left and right, when it was launching coups left and right all over the world. And now Bechtel had a company man at the top of all of it. So every time governments were overthrown, every time the IMF and World Bank went into these poor countries to offer them infrastructure loans, who do you think got awarded these lucrative contracts to build the dams, to build the power plants? Companies like Bechtel. Within just a few short years, Bechtel's men in the CIA and US government got it contracts not just in America, but all across the Middle East, Europe, and South America as well. Eventually, the US government CIA and Bechtel were so close that Bechtel became known as the working arm of the CIA. Bechtel would come to employ some of the most influential government officials of the 20th century, while the CIA and US government would come to employ some of Bechtel's brightest minds too. George Shultz worked as the US Treasury Secretary under Nixon in 1972. Two years later, he left the government to become an executive and later the chairman of Bechtel, the first non-family member to hold that position in its history. Just a few years later, he went back into the government as a Secretary of State in 1982, and when his time as Secretary of State ended, he went right back into Bechtel, serving as a director until 2006. Another name on the list, Casper Weinberger worked as Vice President and General Counsel to Bechtel for five years, before being appointed to U.S. Secretary of Defense in 1981. You know, the guy that oversees the U.S. war machine, second only to the President. Even Riley Bechtel, the guy in charge of Bechtel from 1989 to 2017, was appointed to President Bush's Export Council while he was still running the company. Now you may be thinking, isn't it a major conflict of interest to take executives from a company that relies on government contracts and appoint those executives to the government that's supposed to be giving out those contracts? Yes, yes it is. Bechtel was building harbors and oil refineries in Kuwait. They were advising the King of Saudi Arabia on his construction plans. But that still wasn't enough. In America, Bechtel had become known for its mega projects. Projects people thought were impossible but made billions of dollars in profits. So if Bechtel really wanted to make a name for itself and conquer the Middle East just like it did with America, it would need a contract just as big, just as expensive, and just as impossible as the ones it had done in America. And so Bechtel set its sights on Iraq. Bechtel's history in Iraq stretches back to the 1950s, when the Iraq Petroleum Company hired it to build an oil pipeline between Iraq and Syria. But then when Saddam Hussein became president in 1979, doing business with the government became close to impossible. While other American companies just packed their bags and left, Bechtel saw befriending Iraq's dictator as an irresistible challenge. If it could convince Saddam Hussein to let an American company build a brand new oil pipeline from Iraq to Jordan, Bechtel wouldn't just make billions of dollars in profits, it would become an American hero. The one company that got America back into Iraq's oil fields. The only problem was there was no reason for Saddam Hussein to listen or care about anything Bechtel had to say. He was too busy making war with Iran. If Bechtel wanted to get into Iraq, it would need some help. Luckily, it had just the guy, George Shultz. Remember our guy George, the one who was the chairman of Bechtel before becoming the US Secretary of State? Well, as Secretary of State, he was in the perfect position to help Bechtel catch Saddam's attention. So in 1983, while the US government was receiving almost daily reports that Saddam Hussein was attacking his own people with chemical weapons, George called up his old friend Donald Rumsfeld for a special little mission to Iraq. 
At the time, Runsfield was working as an unpaid part-time employee and special envoy to the Middle East, but he was exactly the guy George Soros could trust with such a sensitive job. His mission? Travel to Iraq and try to make peace with Saddam Hussein, but at the same time, float the idea of letting Bechtel build a giant oil pipeline to Jordan. Bechtel has so much influence over the American governments that it was literally sending US officials to other countries just to get Bechtel more contracts. Ultimately, Saddam decided not to let Bechtel or anyone else build the oil pipeline because of the risk of Israel blowing it up. But Bechtel has succeeded at one thing. They have Saddam's attention. Any company strong enough to get the American government to do its bidding was a company that Saddam wanted to know more about. So Saddam offered Bechtel another project. Saddam wanted Bechtel to construct PC2, a petrochemical plant that would process millions of barrels of Iraqi oil. But this petrochemical plant would also, by total coincidence, be able to produce the chemicals he needed to make his chemical weapons. So obviously, Bechtel turned down the job, right? No! You see, building the PC2 plant would make them a whopping $2.5 billion in revenue in just the first phase alone. And sure, it was no oil pipeline or whatever, but didn't $2.5 billion have such a nice ring to it? So even though Bechtel and the US government knew the PC2 plant would be used to create deadly chemical weapons, Bechtel went forward with it anyways, with America's blessing. For a while, it looked like Bechtel was about to become Saddam's favorite foreign construction company. Who knew what other projects he would offer them if they did well on this one? Beto was well on their way to getting their oil pipeline or any other project they wanted out of him. But then Iraq invaded Kuwait. As soon as it happened, America told Saddam Hussein to withdraw. Big mistake. In Saddam's view, America was siding with Kuwait, and that meant bad news for Bechtel. Out of nowhere, Iraqi police officers started arresting Bechtel employees. Fearing for their safety, Bechtel withdrew from Iraq, leaving the PC2 plant unfinished. Bechtel was furious. They had spent a lot of money and called in a lot of favors to get into Iraq, and now it had all been for nothing. Bechtel wanted revenge. Bechtel wanted his money back. So Bechtel went back to good old George Shultz and Donald Rumsfeld for help. Only this time, instead of cozying up to Saddam Hussein and trying to get on his good side, Bechtel's asked his pals to do the exact opposite. It wanted the American government to get rid of Saddam Hussein once and for all. And it didn't take long for that wish to come true. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. In 2003, with Donald Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense, America invaded Iraq looking for Saddam's alleged weapons of mass destruction, and Bechtel couldn't believe his luck. As a construction company, nothing made Bechtel quite as happy as the prospect of rebuilding everything America was about to destroy. So while American bombs were dropped across Iraq, destroying important infrastructure and flattening entire neighborhoods, Bechtel reached out to his government contacts to get a head start on those nifty little reconstruction contracts. Just days after the bombing started, the US government announced its plans to rebuild Iraq. And obviously, who better for the government to turn to than their partner in figurative crime, Bechtel? So less than one month, one month after America invaded Iraq, US aid awarded Bechtel with an 18-month construction contract worth up to $680 million. Less than six months later, that budget was raised to more than $1 billion. Over the next few years, the US government would give Bechtel billions more in reconstruction contracts. Every time a US bomb destroyed a water pipeline, road, or school, Bechtel would be right there ready to build it up again. In an attempt to make the process more fair, the government agreed to pay each US contractor in Iraq a guaranteed 10% cost plus profits. That means whatever it costs Bechtel to reconstruct the road, schools, and hospitals, the government would give them a 10% fee on top of that. But what the government didn't plan for is for these contractors like Bechtel to start overcharging for everything. If they're going to get 10% profit on whatever they spent, they might as well spend as much as possible. The more the materials, tools, and workers cost, the more profit they would make. So Bechtel was raking in billions, while not having much to show for it. Instead of using that money for better security or quality construction, they cut back on their real costs as much as possible, doing their best to pocket every last cent they could. In the three years Bechtel operated in Iraq, they only finished about half of the work they were paid for. They blamed it on unstable working conditions and security risks. But the truth is that they never really needed to finish anything. They had already been paid. Their customer was the US government, not the Iraqi people who would actually be using this infrastructure. So for three years, Bechtel milked the Iraqi invasion like a cash cow. And then in 2006, with billions of dollars and too many workers being killed or kidnapped, Bechtel bailed. Bechtel had gotten all it could out of Iraq. And now it was time to find another opportunity a little bit closer to home. A 
It's January 2000 and Bolivia is in chaos. For years, the Bolivian government had been struggling to supply all the citizens with water. With a GDP of just $8 billion and almost 40% of the country living in extreme poverty, this was no easy task. One of Bolivia's biggest issues was that the middle and higher income homes that had water were wasting it, while the government-owned utility companies were too corrupt to have any money left for expansion or maintenance. Luckily, the World Bank had an easy solution. If the government couldn't give water to the people, they would just have to privatize it. Get private companies to take over the distribution of water and construction of pipelines. Private companies wouldn't be afraid of raising rates to cover its cost. And on the surface, it seems like a reasonable argument. The World Bank knew that pushing up water rates would probably cause some serious backlash. To get the job done, it would need a cutthroat, nasty, money-hungry megacorporation that wouldn't be afraid of a little public resistance to their plans. And who better than Bechtel? So in November 1999, a consortium of companies led by Bechtel bid on the contract to privatize water in Cochabamba, Bolivia's fourth largest city. In exchange for $2.5 billion, the Bechtel consortium would spend the next 40 years upgrading the city's water supply. It was a massive win for Bechtel. But in the eyes of the people, the government had just handed a foreign company the one thing that they needed most, fresh, clean water. Suddenly, rumors started spreading that Beto would be installing water meters on wells and they would start privatizing the rain by charging farmers for collecting rainwater. And all that expansion the company promised, it wasn't going to pay for all of it. Oh no, the residents of Cocobama would be paying for everything. Most people in the city could barely afford food, let alone pay for water meters or pipelines to be built. But Bechtel didn't care. This was business, not a charity. So within just a few months, Bechtel almost doubled Cocobama's water rates. Suddenly, water bills that were already difficult to afford now took up almost a quarter of most people's salaries. And when people complained that they wouldn't be able to afford it, all Bechtel did was threaten to shut their water supply off. Cocobama had had enough. So starting in early January 2000, hundreds of thousands of protesters took to the streets. Everyone from sweatshop workers to farmers to retirees rioted against the rate hikes that had made their lives literally unaffordable. In a matter of hours, what started as a cost of living protest turned into a full on water war, with residents battling the police and the army in the streets. Protesters barricaded all roads into the city and took over the central plaza. And at one point, 800 police officers even joined in on the protest, firing tear gas canisters at Bolivian soldiers. It looked like the beginning of a full on revolution. So if the government wanted to survive, Bechtel would have to go. So by mid-April, the Bechtel Consortium abandoned Cochabamba, leaving behind billions of dollars in potential revenue. And with Bechtel's losses in Iraq and Bolivia racking up, they needed to make some cold hard cash fast. On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in the US. For millions of people across the country, the hurricane ruined their lives, their loved ones were killed, their homes destroyed, and they lost everything they owned in the flooding. But while millions of Americans were trying to pick up the pieces of their broken lives, a select few companies saw an opportunity to profit. And Iraq Beto I learned just how profitable destruction could be for a company in the business of building things back up. And Hurricane Katrina was no different. The hurricane had barely reached New Orleans when the US government reached out to Bechtel to manufacture mobile homes for 100,000 people. And just like before, it was a no-bid contract, meaning that no one else was competing with Bechtel on price or delivery times. It was like handing Bechtel a blank check and telling them to go nuts, which is exactly what happened. Instead of building the mobile homes itself, Bechtel subcontract almost every aspect of his work to other companies for a fraction of what it was charging the government. So if it cost subcontractors $5,000 to build a mobile home, Bechtel would charge the government double. And that wasn't even the worst of it. Even though Bechtel was making an insane amount of profit off of these homes, it didn't care if any of them were finished. By the end of the contract, thousands of unfinished mobile homes were left standing empty in Arkansas. But Bechtel wasn't alone. Almost every other contractor involved in Hurricane Katrina overcharged and underdelivered on their contracts. In the end, it would cost American taxpayers over $170 billion to repair the damage from the hurricane. $170 billion that ended up in the pockets of companies like Bechtel. Over the past 125 years, Bechtel has been involved in some of the biggest construction projects in the world. They restored Kuwait's oil fields after they were set ablaze during the Iraqi invasion. They built the Hanford Waste Treatment Plant in Washington to dispose of radioactive waste. 
They built the Ivanpah Solar Power System, which is the biggest solar facility in the world. They built Jubail Industrial City in Saudi Arabia, which was the biggest waste of government money in history. The Athens Metro System, and even the new shell that encloses the Chernobyl reactor. And there are probably many more military installations they built that are top secrets. Just imagine the reconstruction contracts they're getting right now for Ukraine, but their public projects are all we really know about them. And the Bechtel family is going to keep it that way. And you want to know who else is going to keep it that way? Bill and Hillary Clinton. See, the Clintons also have their own set of dark secrets. See, in the span of around three decades, more than 50 people connected to the Clintons have died. 50 people! And these 50 people all magically died in one of the three ways. Suicide, plane crash, or robbery gone wrong. Just those three. And why did all of these people die? Well, one reason could be that all these people had dirt on the Clintons that could have ruined their political careers. We're talking about corruption, sexual harassment, the whole nine yards. But now, they're conveniently all dead. And all these deaths magically came to an end after Clinton left the White House. And we expose it all in our new private documentary, The Clinton Kill List, that you can watch right now by clicking the card on the screen. One member said that this is by far the ballsiest content that anyone's ever strung together. They kill investigators and I technically investigated them here. So click the card on the screen to watch now.